A young woman who was nearing the age of 35 found herself single. And she was starting to feel a little bit desperate. She wanted to be married. And so she went out to the woods to pray. And she stayed there for a long time praying to God to help her find a husband to give her guidance. And the hours were passing by. She was not aware that it was starting to get dark. It was starting to fall. And nighttime was coming. And she started to doze off as she was praying. And all of a sudden, a, an owl started singing. It said, who? Who? And she woke up and said, anyone, Lord, anyone. Well, we can certainly relate at times to her desperation and to what she was going through. Of course, we'll see that as Christians, it cannot just be anyone. As Christians, we should never confront marriage as, well, I'll marry whomever. There are certain guidelines in the Word of God to help us in choosing the right person to marry. Now, as I was preparing this sermon, I was fascinated because I was reading all these commentaries, all these people, and they were all talking about the blessings of being single. All the blessings of being single. And so, of course, the cynical part of me took over, and I decided I want to check out who was writing these things to see if they were married or not. Every single one of them was married. And yet they were talking about the blessings of being single. And I think, well, maybe they just forgot about the miseries that come with being alone. I mean, there were a few, like this one pastor, you know, in his message, he was being very honest and talked about the loneliness that he experienced, the struggles that he went through before he got married. As a Christian, of course, waiting faithfully for the Lord and waiting faithfully to do what God wanted him to do and the struggles that he went through and how hard it was for him. But overall, they make it sound like, wow, everything is so easy, everything is so wonderful, no problems. And I think when people get married, they forget how difficult it is to be single. That before you were married, what you were looking for, and how hard you search for it, and all the relationships you may have gone through to get to a place where you finally got to and found someone compatible, someone that you can say, yes, I can see myself spending the rest of my life with this person. How long did it take you to get there? You know, all the bad relationships, all the breakups, all the heartaches, all the struggles, Yet, we were constantly in the search for the right person. Well, this morning, I want to talk about being single. Next week, I'll talk about being married. But obviously, this passage deals with both. But it's important that you realize that I'm not speaking to those who are married here, although in some ways I will be speaking to those who are married because there are instructions here as well about those who choose to get married, those single people who choose to get married, the responsibilities that fall upon them. But I'm speaking mostly to Christians who are single and then again, those who are Christian. If you're single and you're not Christian, the only message I have for you is repent of your sins, turn to Christ, and then this advice would apply to you. Otherwise, this passage is not relevant to you because this is the word of God for the people of God. But here we are in Corinth, and Corinth has been the great case study, a very possible thing that can go wrong with the church. And here are certain issues that arose because of sexual problems that were going on. Some men within the congregation were heading off to prostitutes. Others were committing adultery in other fashions. Some were then going to the other extreme and saying that sex was wrong, it was filthy, it was bad, and we should get rid of it, and we should live as celibate, even though they were married. And so Paul has to write to them concerning issues that they raised and to correct them about these things. And one of the things that he deal with is about being single. And I want to first address the idea of remaining single. Look at verse 1. Not for the matters you wrote about. It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. And then in verse 8, Paul states, Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. Paul says, I wish that all of you were like me. And there's a great debate whether Paul was ever married. Some believe that because he was Pharisee, that he had to be married, and apparently he, was, he became a widower at a very young age. But the problem with that, of course, is those ideas about a Pharisee being married are second century ideas. And they don't necessarily apply to the first century. In my opinion, Paul never got married. Paul literally had what he refers to here as the gift of being celibate. He was alone. And he was content to be alone. He had no agony in being alone. He knew that this is the calling that God had given to him. And he's saying to others, it is best if you are like me. And you might think, well, Paul... What are you saying? Wait a minute. In the Garden of Eden, God created man. And he said it's not good for man to be alone. And he created woman. 
Marriage is in the institution of God. God desires, how can he say that it is good to be single? Well, because he's saying in light of the present circumstances. In light of what Christians were going through at that time, he says, in light of that, it was good to them to remain alone if possible. We'll see that he eventually says, if you can't, you can't. But if you can, yes. Because the early church had many things that they were going through. Many struggles and persecution was beginning to add up. And things were getting worse and worse and worse for Christians. You know, it's one thing when you're being tortured for Christ. It's one thing when you have to stand up for Christ and say, you know what, I'll die for the Lord. And we see many believers, you saw the Egyptian believers being killed for Christ because they're Christians. It's one thing to have that happen to you. But imagine if it happened and you see your wife being tortured or your children being tortured. It changes everything. Now something that you may have been able to bear may become unbearable. And you might be tempted to recant, to deny the Lord. You know, if someone says, well, you know, either deny the Lord or I'll kill your children. I'll kill your spouse. Then the temptation will be there. And Paul says, in light of the struggles that we are in, in light of the present struggles, it is better to be alone. You know, and I would say that certainly certain people who enter certain ministries, it is better for them to be alone. You know, I've been in rough neighborhoods. Really rough neighborhoods. And I don't mean Cliffside Park. And I don't mean... I don't mean West New York. I mean really bad neighborhoods where really I, the first time I remember I went to Harlem, I felt like I was in a war zone. I was shocked that people could live like that. And when you deal in ministry in those kind of places and you're constantly dealing with people who are, who are, who are drugged up or have issues that are just so critical, you realize, is this a good environment for me to bring a spouse and children? When I did all those ministries, I was single. I was alone. So I did not have that concern. But I see these individuals who think, you know what? I'm going to go and do that ministry and my wife and kids will just have to follow. It's too bad for them. I'm thinking, no. The Bible does not teach that. And they make it sound like they're more spiritual because they're doing that. That somehow, oh, the Lord called me to the worst neighborhood possible and I'm going to go there. And there you have your wife and your kids. And they make it sound like somehow that's from the Lord. And here Paul shows that it's not from the Lord. And I'm going to get to that pass in a second. I remember when I was working in New York City in Riverside Church, I was doing my work there for a ministry requirement. And I was working there, and it was this young boy that my heart just broke for him. White, blonde, blue-eyed boy. Nine years old. His family was wealthy, quite wealthy. But they had purposely chosen to live in a poor neighborhood. And you know what that meant? That this poor nine-year-old boy got beaten up and mugged on a regular basis. And I thought, my goodness, this is so wrong. They, if you want to follow your calling, great. But to torture your family in the calling, how can this be of God? How can this be something good? I thought that family could have done much better by letting the love of Christ begin in their home. And showing the love of Christ to that poor child who was being tormented and was becoming more anti-Christ because of that situation. Paul makes it very clear that if you're single and you want to remain single, it's perfect because you can serve the Lord wholeheartedly. But if you're married, you are divided. Look at those verses, 32 to 35. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affair. How he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world. How he can please his wife. And his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affair. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world. How she can please her husband. I am saying this to your own good. Not to restrict you. But that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. If you are married, you are divided. You cannot serve the Lord full time, even if you're a minister. Even if you're a missionary. You cannot. Because you are divided. To neglect the home is to neglect Christ and the ministry that he's called us to do. You know, when you see these men who go out and they go to serve the Lord and they don't care about their families... 
and you see their, their wives just being tortured, you see their children heading into the world, that is not of God. That is not pleasing to the Lord. And again, they make it sound like they are so spiritual. But how can you be spiritual if what you're doing is contrary to the Word of God? In one of his books, Peter Wagner talks about John Stott, who passed away, and he, he was a, a, a British minister who was single, and he had the gift of being single. And he said, while this man was writing books and going to conferences and doing all these things, he who was married and had children did not have the liberty to do as many things as John Stott did for ministry. It put restrictions on him, but those are restrictions that come with marriage. But if you're single, yes, if you want to remain single, praise God, you can serve the Lord in that capacity. But if you choose to get married, then you have to realize that you are divided. Now, I was talking about ministry, but to me that means divided in everything. When you see these men who dedicate themselves to work, 40, 60 hours of work, and they neglect their wives, they neglect their children, that is not good. That is not Christian, that is not godly, that is not the way the scripture tells us to be. We are divided, and all that we do, if you're married, you are divided. But, if you can remain single, great. That means you have a calling, a gift. Look at verse 7. I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that gift. In other words, if you're single, that's a gift from God. If you're married, that's a gift from God. The same word that he uses for, er for every other gift of the Holy Spirit, charisma. That's the same word he's using here. There are those who have the gift of being single. And God has called them to that, to serve him in full-time capacity. You know, that's important for the church to know. Because today, I think single people not only suffer because they're single, they suffer because of married people. Because think about it, every time a single person sees married people, what do they say to that person? Hey, you found the right person yet? Did you find Mr. Right? Did you find Miss Right? Hey, how's he still looking for the other half? I love that, especially I love the other half thing. Like, you know, somehow we were like one of those commercials where you're like, you know, you don't have a, you have a deficiency. You're not taking enough vitamins or enough fruits and you're, you're like half a person walking around. You know, when I met my wife, I was a complete person. You know, it's okay to keep the language of the other half, but realize that there are people that God has gifted to be alone. And so what you're literally trying to do is take them away from their calling, take them away from their ministry. You know, if I have someone who I know has been seeking a husband, has been seeking a wife, then I have no problem asking them, hey, have you been praying? Has the Lord led you? Is, have you found anybody? But if they're not, if they're content being alone, we should leave them alone. And praise God, because that's the ministry. That's like looking at someone like Paul or Jesus and saying there's something wrong with them because they never got married. No, there's nothing wrong with them. That was their gift. That was their calling. That's what God wanted them to do. You're married. That's what God wanted you to do. That's your gift. But it's so important to realize that. Now, if you want to remain single and serve the Lord in that capacity, great. And you might ask yourself, how do I know if I have the gift of being single? I'm glad you asked. That's a good question. The first question I'll tell you is, how are you handling your sexual desires? How do you handle your sexual desires? Look what Paul says in verse 9. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry for it is better to marry to burn with passion. How do you manage your sexual desires? You know, I, I find it funny because I have to use the word sex a lot in this sermon. And I remember the first sermon that I preached here, and I used the word sex. And I had to use it a number of times. And an elder lady came to me after the service, and she's gone on to be with the Lord. And she said to me, couldn't you preach about sex without using the word sex? <laughs> and I was thinking, what other word? I was thinking, man, I'm very PG. I'm so PG up here. I'm not R-rated. <laughs> but for her, that was R-rated. She couldn't take it. You know, trust me, I could be more R-rated if I want to speak to you bluntly about how Christians should behave themselves. But I'm trying to make sure that, I'm, that I try to keep it as clean as possible. You know, thank God that Paul was not a Puritan. And Paul had no problems. Look, if you have sexual drives, natural sexual drives that God has created. See, God created sex. Sex is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. God created it for our well-being. The bad thing is the perversity of sexual things within our society. 
We live in a society that is so saturated with sex that it's become a perversity. And that's why it's, no, it's abnormal. Sex is simply a, an appetite. It's part of who we are, just like eating. It's an appetite. But we have made it such a strict thing that we live like Puritans. Either you live like a Puritan or you live like a heathen. And there seems to be no middle ground. You know, C.S. Lewis captured it very well when he said, imagine if you had a, she you had a, a table full of food, all kinds of great meals that you love to eat, and then you put a blanket over it. And then imagine I started taking that bank blanket slowly away, and you started going, oh my goodness, oh I can't take it, oh, oh my goodness. You always think, something's wrong with that person. That person's sick. <laughs> if you have a table full of food and I'm, I'm slowly uncovering and you're going crazy, something is wrong with you. Well, that's how our culture reacts to sex. It means that something is wrong with us. And of course, one of the things is that we are so like infants, we're like children who cannot handle an adult topic, who cannot deal with things as adults and see things the way God sees them. God created this. This is normal. And if you have those sexual impulses, uh, impulses, how are you managing them? The Bible makes it very clear that, of course, as if, we, if you're not married, then sex outside of marriage is wrong. It's sin. And we're to deal with that temptation. We're not animals. We can control ourselves. Imagine if people went by a sexual impulse and said, I can't control myself. That would apply to everybody. The adulterer can say, oh, I can't help it. I have to sleep around. I have an impulse. Now, we can control ourselves. We're not animals. But if you find that you have to give a lot of energy to control yourself, then you're not meant to be alone. You're not meant to be alone. If you were meant to be alone, you would be able to take those things and control them. And eventually they will subside. But if you cannot control, it means that you are not meant to be alone. If you're one of you meant to be single, that's one of the qualifications right there. A second qualification that I would put there is that deep sense of loneliness. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, we read, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. The Lord says that because the man was lonely. To be alone means to be separated from others. He is separated. How can one who is created and nothing else has been created yet, feel alone. It's because God designed him not to be alone. And when you have that deep sense of loneliness, when you realize that, well, you know, I, I, hang out, I hang out with my Christian friends, I hang out with my family, I have all these relationships, but still I feel lonely. I feel alone. That's a clear sign that you're meant to be with someone else, that God designed you to be with someone else. So pray about it. As Christians, if you're single, you should pray about it. Lord, what is it that you have for me? Do you want me to remain single? Well, look at, look at your own body, look at your own life, see if you can handle yourself. Or do you want me to be, to be married? And that's the second point I want to deal with. If you're meant as a single person to be married, then what entails in, in seeking a spouse? Let me give you some guidelines. First of all, while you're looking for your spouse, live a godly life. Live a Christian life. You know, so many people who are young, they're Christian, or call themselves Christians, and they're not living the way they should live before they meet their spouse. Some of them walk around like, woe is me. You know? It's like if a person's like fasting, they're not eating, and they walk around like this. Uh, uh, I'm just fasting. I'm fasting for the Lord. You know? Some people who are single, they, be, they behave that way. Oh, yeah, I'm single. It's for Jesus. I'm alone for Jesus. It's like, you know, come on. Don't be that way. If you're going to be single, enjoy being single for the Lord. Pray. Read the Word of God. Be involved in missions. Do things. I remember when I was a young person, I was single. I got involved in every kind of ministry possible. I got involved in everything you can imagine to serve the Lord. I enjoyed it. You know, I said to myself, why? Well, you know, there was a time when I could literally go to a restaurant by myself and enjoy a good meal alone. And not feel that I have to have someone there. You know, I can't do that anymore. But I used to. I used to be able to go to the theater alone and watch a movie. And I was fine. I can't do that anymore either. There are things that change in you. But if you're single, don't walk around like misery. Oh, misery. You know, 
live a good Christian life. And by good Christian life, I don't mean drink, dance, and have sexual relations outside of marriage. You see all these young Christians who think that it's okay, that somehow not being a single means I'm going to go out to nightclubs and I'm going to indulge in this kind of revelry, this kind of sinful behavior and call myself a believer. And I'm shocked because they keep going to these places and they wonder why they can't find a good Christian person. It's like that song, you know, looking for love in all the wrong places. What, you serious? That's where you're going to go? You know, my wife was telling me before she got married, you know, how she was with Christian young women who were in the same condition, who were also seeking a husband. They would pray. They would be involved in ministry. She got involved in every kind of ministry in the church, just like I did. You know, it's that kind of engagement. Be involved in the things of God. You know, and don't do it in a way where it's like drudgery. Oh, my goodness, how horrible it is. No, serve the Lord in joy. And as you're waiting, yes, you know, pray, God, you know, guide me to that person. But be, saw, be serving the Lord with a, with a heart full of joy. And don't get involved in the things of this world. You know, when people tell me, oh, you know, I just haven't lived. I've got to go out and, and live. I said, that's living? That was dying. I mean, maybe it's because you don't know the environment. I was raised in that environment. I didn't, see, I didn't see live people. I saw a lot of dead people. A lot of dead people. Some slowly dying. Some building addiction to alcohol. I remember this one lady, I, I felt so bad for her. I remember when I was a little boy, I saw her. She was about 20 years old. Ten years later, I saw her. She looked like she was 60. That's living? It was horrible. But they think that that's living it up. No, that's dying. Living it up is to live the life that God created for you to live. That is living it up. That is finding the fullness of the life that God has for you. So that's the first thing I would tell you. Secondly, as a young person, I would tell you, under no circumstances should you marry a non-believer. Don't even consider marrying a non-believer. Paul tells us 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 to 18. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. We are not to be yoked with unbelievers. And yoke means to be involved in an intimate relationship where you're sharing common dreams and priorities and goals. Let me tell you this much. Marriage is difficult enough as it is. There's no promise that if you're a Christian that somehow everything's going to work out and you're always going to be happy in marriage and things are always going to be great. No. But if you marry a non-believer, I'll guarantee you it's going to be 10 times worse, 100 times worse, a billion times worse. You know, I remember this lady who was part of this church, and she told me, you know, she met this guy, and she decided to marry him. He was such a nice guy, such a sweetheart. He wasn't a Christian, but he would let her go to church, stuff like that, and he was fine with it, and he had no problem dropping her off at church. As soon as they got married, he began to make her life a living hell. By the time he passed away, he was a blasphemer, cursing her out and cursing God out all the time. She nursed him until the moment that he died. And she regretted that she had ever married him because of the misery that he put her through. Because they were unequally yoked. You know, I would even tell you to be so cautious because there's so many Christians who think, well, you know, he's not a Christian, but maybe he can come to Jesus. You know, we used to call it, I don't know what they call it now. I don't know if, I don't know if there is a name for it now. But in my day, <laughs> we used to call it missionary dating missionary dating. I was like, oh my goodness. You know, you have these people who want to get married so they will find somebody who's not a Christian. Like, but I'll convert them to Jesus. <laughs> you can't convert them to Jesus. Only the Holy Spirit can convert them to Jesus. And the problem is that they, once you get involved with someone, it becomes harder because now all the emotions are involved. Do not try to do that missionary dating. Do not try to be involved in it. I would even caution young people 
that when you develop friendships with people of the same sex who are not Christians, that it, that is, I mean, of the opposite sex, that are not Christians, that's not good. You know, if you have, if you're a female and you have male friends who are not Christians, that's dangerous because friendship can lead to something else, as we all know. When you start spending time with someone, you start getting emotionally involved with them. And before you know it, now you want to be engaged with them. You want to be with them. And it becomes dangerous. It is better to be with Christians. And actually, I would say it's better to be Christians no matter, no matter what the condition. To cultivate a good Christian life. Be with believers. Uh, finally, or thirdly, I should say, uh, guard your moral purity. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul tells us, flee from sexual immorality. It means stay as far away as possible from sexual temptation. Life is difficult enough as it is. Why are you playing near the fence? But Christians do this all the time. Paul says flee from it, which means run away. If you don't know common language, run away. It doesn't mean come near it and watch it and look at it and go, oh, how close can I get to this? You know, it means get out of there. Don't even be anywhere in the vicinity of that neighborhood and you won't have that problem. You know, it's like, like, like that joker says, you know, the, the guy goes to the doctor and says, Doc, I broke my arm in two places. And the, and the doctor says, then, well, then stay out of those places. Why do we go to the very places we know are going to tempt us? Stay as far away as possible from those things. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. I don't think you realize the magnitude of that. You don't realize the magnitude. I, I hope you spend more time with me so you understand the magnitude of that. God always promised his people that he would dwell with them. The glory of God used to dwell in a place called the tabernacle. People lived around, the, all the Israelites lived around, but the presence of God was in that one place. Then, the presence of God was in the temple. And one day it departed from the temple, and God said that he will return, and that his glory will dwell with his people once again. The embodiment is in Jesus Christ, who is the glory of God. The fullness of God dwells in Jesus. And now, it dwells in us as the people who belong to Jesus. Your, the inside of you is the Holy Spirit. Your body is holy. It belongs to God. It does not belong to you. It belongs to God. You are to be holy with your body. Don't allow it to become unpure. Don't allow it to be contaminated with anything that's unclean. Glorify your God with your body. Again, if you can only grab the, if you can only get the gravity of the fact that the Holy Spirit lives in you, that everywhere you go, the presence of God goes. Why should we take it to dirt and contaminate it and make it unholy? Finally, I would advise you not only to be with Christian friends, but to find good Christian counsel. Godly, you know, if you're if you're a young woman. Find older, godly women who are mature in the Lord and seek their counsel, seek their advice. If you're a young man, seek older men who are godly, who love the Lord, who are serving faithfully, and seek their counsel in all that you do so you, you may remain faithful to the Lord. You know, when you are dating someone, you have blinders on. If you forgot, just in case you've forgotten, you have blinders. All you see is that person, and you're gaga. It's a wonderful thing. It's a beautiful thing. But it's also a blinding thing. And it's good to have objective people outside of you that will look at you and say, hey, he's not right for you. Hey, she's not right for you. Hey, this is going to lead you in the wrong direction. This person is dragging you down. And once you hear that counsel, you need to listen to it. Don't you say, oh, yeah, but. No, yeah, but. Listen to it. You know, if you have godly parents, praise God. And you have, you have a, a one-upmanship right there. Listen to their counsel. If you don't have godly parents, adopt some. Adopt some. 
You know, deal with people around you that you know you can trust their judgment. Because it's true that once we're dating, everything goes blind for us. We're, we become obscure. And we need someone to guide us and help us on that journey. You know, God has created us. He has designed us very specifically. He designed certain people to be alone and to have that ministry and that calling. Others, he designed to be married. What is the calling that God has given to you? What is the gift that God has given to you? It's important for us as Christians to know where we belong, what we're supposed to be doing. And once we do it, to know what comes with the territory, how we are to live unto the Lord. So many times we're just running, you know, without thinking. It's amazing because when it comes to our careers, think about it, and I, I read this years ago and it's true. When it comes to our careers, think about how much planning goes into it. We, could, we think about what school we're going to go to, what degree program that I want to do, uh, what kind of classes I got to take. We are really meticulous when it comes to choosing our career and the work we're going to do. When it comes to choosing our spouse, ah, ah, I'm in love. I'm in love. He's, she's so beautiful. Oh, he's so handsome. And we lose it. It's almost like, my goodness, if there's something we should be even more meticulous about, it's who we marry. Because this person can make your life a living hell. Or this person can make your life a blessing. It is so critical. So I encourage young people to, to really, to take it as seriously as you take your career. Take it as seriously as you take your relationship with God. Because it's that critical. But it's a blessing from the Lord. If you're single and God's called you to that ministry, praise God. Serve Him. If He's called you to be married, praise God. Serve Him in a divided capacity, but serve Him. Let us pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You, dear God, that it teaches us, instructs us, guides us to the people that we are to be and how we are to behave. Father, I pray that you give us wisdom in all that we do. That in everything we do, Father, we may be pleasing to you. But we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.